Welcome everyone. See that folks are still joining. Please welcome. Uh, my name is Cheryl Dorsey, president of Echoing Green. I'm so glad to be here with you all today. Um, thank you so much for joining When Women Lead, Inclusive Leadership in Social Innovation. I'm gonna do just a couple of logistics. Please use the chat and the Q&A function throughout the event. And there's uh, no time like the present. So as you're getting settled in, tell us where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear from you. Um, let me just start by saying that Echoing Green is thrilled to join the City Foundation as part of its celebration of Women's History Month. We are looking forward to this intersectional conversation, one where gender, race, and a commitment to inclusive leadership converge. I will say that we have a lot of ground to cover in the next hour or so, but with these three extraordinary leaders that I have the privilege to interview shortly, um, at the end of our time together, I am certain that we will be smarter about three things. Together, we will have had the chance to learn more about how to create on ramps to economic inclusion for women and people of color. Number two, we'll all have a better understanding of how gender informed and race informed funding can accelerate equity. And third, through the example and work of the two amazing social entrepreneurs joining us today, we will understand and recognize the outsized impact that can be achieved when we invest in more women and more women of color. But before I proceed, I'd like to uh, make three acknowledgements. First, a humble land acknowledgement to the Nacoch tanks, the indigenous people of the land where I now sit. Secondly, our hearts go out to the people of Boulder, Colorado, who lost 10 of their own last night. And third, I think it's important to note that we continue to mourn the loss of eight residents of Atlanta and surrounding areas, including six Asian American women, victims of hate and racially motivated and gender motivated violence. Thank you for giving me that moment to, to share those acknowledgements. For those of you just joining us and who are new to Echoing Green, Echoing Green is an early stage funder of emerging social entrepreneurs. In 2018, we formed one of our most transformational partnerships with the City Foundation, directly investing together $2.5 million in emerging social innovators of color, while helping to build out a more supportive ecosystem for leaders and communities of color across the United States. With the launch of Echoing Green's new Racial Equity Philanthropic Fund, a $50 million philanthropic fund to transform the field of social innovation, as well as ensure that today's heightened awareness of racial equity translates into sustained action and impact. We have been able to build upon our three-year partnership with the City Foundation. That's why I'm so thrilled to announce that City Foundation has become a lead partner in our new fund this year. We are really excited about the work ahead, and that's in no small measure due to the leadership the commitment and the phenomenal track record of Brandy McHale, head of community investing and development at City and president of the City Foundation. I'm happy to welcome Brandy for a quick fireside chat before we launch into this triumvirate of extraordinary women social impact leaders. Hi, Brandy, it's so wonderful to see you. Hello, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm just so thrilled to be part of this conversation. And thank you. And we really appreciate you co-hosting this important conversation. And let me start off, Brandy. I have so little time with you, but so many questions to ask. So I had to be really thoughtful in our few moments together. But I'll start by saying, you know, at Echoing Green, we have a phrase, and that phrase is moment of obligation, which really does capture why leaders do what they do. You know, what is the animating passion, one's journey to doing the work of social impact? And I'm gonna ask Teresa and Fanta, our two social innovators, that question when they join us. But I think it would be really great for you to talk about your moment of obligation. I think it's a perfect way to invite in the audience to this important conversation. Great. Well, I would say that my moment of obligation probably came to me pretty early in life, although I'm sure I was not wise enough to recognize it as that. Um, I was 16, I left school. I had a really turbulent childhood. I felt 
disconnected. I had really little sense of belonging. Um, probably why I'm so passionate about the Foundation's youth economic opportunity work and the social entrepreneurs at Echoing Green that work with young adults. Um, you know, and after a few years of doing all the things I probably shouldn't have ever been doing, um, and I would be very unhappy with my own children for doing, um, I went to work in a family business. I got my GED. I enrolled part-time in uh, uh, college classes. It all wasn't a straight line, um, but, um, you know, I definitely took some detours in life. But I realized that I had social capital and connections that made a huge difference. My grandparents had a family business and they put me to work. My stepfather worked at the local state university um, and got me into classes. I started volunteering and I got um, developed a network with other adults who had connections in the world. Um, you know, I applied cold for this summer internship opportunity at this place called Citibank. Um, you know, and step by step, I kind of turned it around. Um, but it really wasn't just my hard work. I realize now that there were all sorts of tools available to me that just weren't available to others. Um, so I used to say it was luck and hard work, and there was some of that, but the reality is I, I benefited from an un uneven playing field. I had social capital, I had economic capital available to me, the color of my skin certainly didn't hurt and it probably helped. Um, and so my moment of obligation is to level the playing field for others so that the road to opportunity is more of a straight line. And for me, more importantly, that the detours in life don't become permanent exit ramps for anybody. Thank you for sharing that, Brandy. I mean, I've, I've known you for a few years and didn't um, uh, know the full extent of your journey and it's incredibly powerful. And I so appreciate you as the leader that you are with the social capital that you have now using your privilege and positional authority, not only to name it, but to recognize how important it is um, and how many of us lack it. So I so appreciate you sharing that. That, that was incredibly meaningful. Um, thank you for that. The second thing I want to quickly dig into you with is, um, you know, and you alluded to this, Brandy, so much of your work with and leadership at City has been about creating more on ramps for economic inclusion for people of color, women, women of color. Um, and this certainly includes the partnership um, that we are fortunate enough to, to, to have with you all. And I think we'd love to hear a little bit more about your vision for the foundation's work in this area especially in the way that it ties to the phenomenal research report that city did last year closing the racial inequality gaps the economic cost of racial inequality in the u.s if you don't mind diving in and sharing a little bit more about that work and how it relates to what you do at the foundation sure so the the research report that you referenced it notes that if we close the income housing education and investment gaps between white americans and black americans today $5 trillion could be added to the US GDP over the next five years. I mean, this just makes smart business and economic sense, but the way we do business today is not gonna get us to where we need to be. So our work at City and the foundation is really about changing the status quo in our company, our industry, and contributing hopefully to that broader societal change. Um, last September, we did launch uh, action for racial equity, the set of strategic investments designed to close the racial wealth gap. And the, the effort is really driven first and foremost by our role as a bank. How do we as a provider of financial services, as an equity investor, as a, a large corporation, we're a big purchaser of goods and services, our role as an employer. So how do we use all of these core capabilities to intentionally work to address income and wealth gaps? that do contribute so much to racial injustice. Um, and for us, it means being intentional, being all in. This isn't about creating some new program that lives off on its own. Um, it's about working horizontally across the company and long-term. This cannot be a one and done. And it also includes a commitment to understanding and becoming an anti-racist institution. You know, to do all of this, um, we have to incorporate a guiding principle in our work. And that 
is to be comfortable being uncomfortable. This is not an easy topic. Um, and this is meant coming out with a bold set of commitments, even though we don't have all the answers necessarily. And we certainly don't know how this is gonna play out long-term. And I can tell you working in the private sector, not having all the answers is definitely not the place where most people sit in my, my institution. Um, and the foundation's work is totally aligned with this um, approach. And as grant makers at the City Foundation, we're not just interested in funding organizations serving communities of color, but funding organizations that are led by people of color and providing flexible dollars to invest in change agents, creating a new status quo. That is not easy stuff to measure in a typical you know, grant report, but we're absolutely committed to it. And our work with Echoing Green um, and your new uh, racial equity agenda is a great example of this approach in action. And I have to say how really honored we are to be working with you and your team on eliminating the systemic barriers that keep us locked into the status quo and really and supporting entrepreneurs developing new approaches to longstanding economic challenges. Wonderful, thank you uh, for sharing more about your commitment and being real about this work. And we know, right, Brandy, it's not just about head, it's also about heart. And the, the fact that you no noted that these are uncomfortable topics to navigate through, but it is the work of the world to do. And I, I just bravo, brava to you and to City. And we're uh, thrilled and look forward to standing alongside you in the years to come and doing this work. The third thing I want to talk to you about is, again, I don't think we can credibly kick off an event during this year's Women's History Month without centering the pandemic. You know, it's interesting to note, Brandy, that at the start of the pandemic, the countries with the best coronavirus responses are all run by women. Germany, Taiwan, New Zealand, Finland, Norway, Iceland, and Denmark. But we also know that there has been a disproportionate impact of the economic you know, devastation of the pandemic on women. Um, you know, as caregivers, as wage earners, we all have heard this term, the notion of the she session. I really do think the audience would benefit from hearing your thoughts and insights on how women have fared during this past years. What both worries you um, as you witnessed this past year as a leader and as a woman, um, but also how we might think about building back better for women on the other side of this uh, global pandemic? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I I'll tell you, this has been, it an is. <laughs> it's, it's been an interesting year for me. I've had these moments of ups and downs. You know, people use the expression I now, um, people working remotely now talk about or have the, the privilege and the opportunity to work remotely, I should say. Um, we talk about, well, now we basically sleep at work. But I have to say, as a, as a woman, I think that, um, as a, and as a working woman, I think that I've, I've um, the line between home and work life has always been mixed in. And the, you know, while I'm at work, I'm thinking about home. While I'm at home, I'm thinking about work. So I actually think that we've been, we're so versatile as women. And I think we've been um, in some ways uniquely positioned to respond to the stress and the and the pressure. Um, you know, on and as I said, this has been a, a tale of sort of two pandemics for me, if, if you will. Um, my company recently appointed a woman CEO, the first woman to head up a large global bank. So on one hand, I'm incredibly emboldened and optimistic about um, uh, women and women's advancement. But then I'm watching my own daughter who's in college and seeing the world she's stepping into. And I question, have I done enough to create a place where she can thrive? Um, and, and as you said, when you look at the, the gaps, uh, wealth gaps through a racial lens and then add in gender, if you look at the health crisis and then add a racial lens and then in gender, the, the challenges are only exponentially compounded. Um, but you know, I think ultimately when I step back, the thing that I'm, I'm and I don't think optimistic in a happy way, but I have a, a, a renewed sense of energy about this issue because this conversation is front and center. Yes. This is headline news. Yes. You know, this is a key part of policy conversations. And so for the first time, 
And as long as I can remember, we don't actually have to be in the business anymore of selling the problem. Um, but we do have, I think, and need to have a really urgent sense of how to sell the solutions. We have a moment where we have a spotlight and attention on the things that have been a concern for organizations like Echo and Green, your entrepreneurs, for the City Foundation. And so, you know, my what keeps me up at night is making sure that we don't blow this opportunity. Uh, perfectly said, and I, I share that same sentiment um, and really appreciate that. Um, and I love um, the two phrases you talked about, urgency, um, couldn't agree more, um, and this notion of selling solutions. And I actually think that is the perfect opportunity to usher in our two social innovators who will now join you, Brandy, in conversation. Uh, Fonta Gilliam, CEO and founder of Invest Susu, and Teresa Hodge, president and CEO of Mission Launch and co-founder of R3 Score Technologies Incorporated. Good afternoon, ladies. So happy to see you two extraordinary social innovators. How are you both doing this afternoon? Doing well, fantastic. Ha happy to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. I am so honored um, to have uh, the three of you now in conversation. It is a, an embarrassment of riches for me as the facilitator. And I think Brandy kicked us off so beautifully in sort of um, tracing the arc of the personal as the professional, right? The journey that we're on that is sort of forged in our lived experiences, the why do you do what you do? I would love to pose that same question to each of you ladies. Please tell us why you do what you do. What was your moment of obligation that led you to be the founders of the company that you are? Let me uh, start with you, Fonta, and then we'll go to Teresa. Absolutely. Um, I'm so excited to be here. And thank you, Cheryl. It's a really good question. You know, when I was when I think about that and kind of really what started it for me, um, a little bit of backstory. So at InvestSusu, we're a fintech company. And one of our signature products is Susu, which is a smart social banking wallet. And it's designed to help people save smarter, uh, build wealth, uh, and send money with people that you know and trust. And it was inspired by a lot of informal social banking traditions that I experienced as a diplomat for 10 years before launching the company. And at the time, I remember being so fascinated by how people in Korea and all over Africa were using these traditions to build wealth and send their kids to school. I came back to the United States and I looked around my community and I said, wow, a lot of the innovation that I saw overseas, we need to be doing here. And so when I think about your question, it was really a combination of timing, that experience and exposure that I would have never gotten otherwise, opportunity, the Echoing Green Grant, um, you guys funded Invest Susu when we were literally an idea, and I don't think there's any other situation in the world that would have allowed us to do that at that time, and we've grown tremendously because of that. So opportunity was a big part of it, and also empathy. You know, um, at the time, I was a single mom, and I had never really struggled as much moving from a very kind of sexy diplomatic career to now having a mouth to feed, right, by myself, <laughs> living in D.C., I think all of those experiences really told me, look, you know, the universe is telling me that I have this idea. Everyone thinks it's crazy, but something in me feels like I need to do it and do it in a way that can empower people. Um, and the rest is history. You know, we're really excited about the progress that we've made, but I would say it was a combination of timing, uh, working as in that experience opportunity, and then empathy and really being able to understand a lot of the struggles that a lot of Americans face is what gave me the courage to kind of step out and launch the company. Thank you for sharing that. And we're going to get back uh, in just a moment to um, more about the business model of Invest Susu. Um, but again, at Echoing Green, we're fond of saying talent and genius is equally distributed. <laughs> Opportunity is not. Um, and we see that in social entrepreneurs like Fanta and now Teresa. Teresa, please share with us um, your moment of obligation, the why you do what you do. Sure. Now, first, thank you to City Foundation and to Echoing Green for this opportunity. Really am grateful to be here with you. Um, for me, uh, the work that I do supports the one in three Americans that are living with an arrest or conviction record. And the moment of obligation came for me when I found myself as one of those one in three Americans sitting inside of a prison. And um, I went to prison very late in life. I went to prison when I was 44 years old. I had had a professional career. And although I was heartbroken because I never expected 
that I would find myself ever in prison, I recognized how privileged I was while I was sitting in prison. And it was being around women who um, did not have the institution of family like I had su supported. Um, I had come from just really a strong family support who supported me throughout the prison journey. And for me, I think prison was the social topic that picked me. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I picked it back. Um, it was it, at a visiting, um, a visitation with my daughter, we were sitting outside and there were a lot of children running around and I had just read an article and the article said seven out of 10 children who have a parent incarcerated is more than likely to go to prison. And as a mom in prison, my heart broke. And my daughter was visiting me and she had graduated from college. Um, and I told her what I read. And there were a lot of children running around that day. And I said, count 10 children and tell me which three deserve not to go to prison. And in that moment, you know, she and I partnered on this journey to ensure that the um, prison doesn't have to ruin your life for the rest of your life. And we became very committed to solutions to ensure that if a person goes into prison, that they could come out and connect opportunity. That's so beautifully rendered and thank you both. And Brandy, um, just in listening to both Fanta and Teresa, um, and your story as well, sort of the journey that we are all on um, to compose our lives. Um, I'm wondering, as you sit at the helm of the foundation, how do you take into account sort of the power of lived experience in your decision matrix? How, how, do, you, how do you incorporate the richness of the things that we've just heard? Yeah, well, I'm a really... Um big believer in that you invest in people and ideas. Um, I'm, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I'm always surprised when people say that they say, oh, you have a reputation as, you know, you can be a, a tough grant maker, or you know how to ask tough questions. And it always surprises me because what I'm really doing is I'm trying to really, I'm trying to learn about what's behind the idea. You can always change and modify the execution of something. You know, you have an idea, you can always course correct, but who you are fundamentally and what drives you, that's the, that's the constant. So I think it's an incredibly important. You know, one of the things that we, um, that we have here at, at City that we started last year was an impact investing fund to invest in, uh, in social entrepreneurs and, uh, at, you know, a range of for-profit enterprises whose businesses are generating a positive social or environmental return. A lot of the work we do has been influenced by our partnership with Echoing Green. And what I've learned in this process is that, um, you know, when you're doing seed capital investments, it's all about taking a bet on, on an individual and a person. So I, I think it's the core of, of what we need to do. And frankly, I think it's also just if you're not even an entrepreneur, if you're not an investor, even in, in if you're somebody that's building great teams, hiring people, I always say you can teach people what they need to do, but I look for that sense of persistence and grit and that boldness. Um, and frankly, people who have each other's back. So I mean, it's at the core of just about every decision that I'm involved in. Uh, thank you for saying that. And sort of, so let's let's get into it. You mentioned sort of the idea, the innovation. What's behind that? Um, and both of these extraordinary women, as innovators, have brought into the marketplace disruptive ideas, disruptive business models. Teresa, I'll start with you now. Tell us a little bit more about Mission Launch and R three Score Technology. What makes it innovative? Um, what are you trying to scale in the world? Yeah. So for us, we're trying to disrupt what we think is um, the main barrier to people getting back on their feet after coming in contact with the legal system, and that's the criminal background check. Um, it is a tool that has been widely used um, as a legal instrument, and it documents and locks a person in time. Um, the only thing it tells you is if a person has a record or not. But today, um, this tool is widely used to determine who gets access to opportunity. And when most people See that a person has a criminal record, it's just easier to say no. Um, what we've done is we take the criminal background check and we provide that information front and center. We don't hide anything, but we believe context makes the difference. 
And so we are able to you know, uh, rate the criminal history on a scale of one to 10, but we know humans are dynamic. And so we add in additional information, um, their capacity, uh, is their college education, work experience, and what we're looking for stability factors. So often in the criminal justice space, we measure uh, recidivism. Recidivism is a metric of failure. Um, and what it means is as a society, not only did that person fail, but we fail. We fail when we don't allow people access to opportunity. And so this tool is a first of its kind. Um, it is a risk algor algorithm used in the criminal justice space, but to pipeline people to opportunity and to give decision makers better data so that they themselves can move beyond the criminal record. Fabulous. Thank you, Teresa. Fonta, tell us more about um, your FinTech InvestSusu. Right, sure. Um, and so I mentioned our signature product is the Susu wallet, you know, and it was really inspired by the reality that financial health is a serious issue here in the United States. You know, the average American has less than $400 in savings um, and the COVID pandemic has really shown the importance of emergency savings um, and needing kind of a lifeline. Um, on the other hand, you know, we do a lot of work with banks and they want to lend, but finding credit ready um, people and small businesses can be really tough. And so we've focused on designing a product, again, inspired by those informal savings traditions, but also very different, modernized, something that can be mainstreamed, um, that uses artificial intelligence, um, social networking tools, and positive peer pressure to help people save smarter, build credit, help them build wealth and their financial health, and then connect them to affordable financial products and services. And so that's what the Susu Wallet does. Um, we're really excited about it as well. Um, we'll be launching it this summer with some really exciting partners in the financial services industry, and there'll be more information to come on that soon. Um, and so, yeah, that's really what we've been focusing on. And I think right now it's so timely with what people are dealing with right now. And we're really excited um, to roll it out. Congratulations. It just, I'm, I'm always inspired when I get to hear about the work of innovators like you both. It really is um, our bridge to tomorrow. So thank you for that. Um, and Brandy, I'm going to ask you, question in a second, and I think it will link back to the city report, but I want to um, raise um, some really interesting statistics that came through another mm -hmm. Echoing Green fellow, um, another African-American woman, Catherine Finney, who started a terrific enterprise called Digital Undivided that tried to mm -hmm. increase access to capital to Black and Latinx tech founders. And her research that she has done over the years through her data arm called Project Diane found that in the tech ecosystem, black female founders essentially receive a zero venture capital. You know, she looked say from like 2012 to 2014 where there were several thousand venture deals, less than 1% of those went to black women. And those black women who did receive outside funding, the average was only about $36,000 while the average seed deal size was more like four and a half million. These disparities and discrepancies are just, um, you know, they're intolerable, they're inequitable, um, and we've got to deal with them. And I'm gonna ask, you know, Fonta and Teresa to talk about their experiences in the second navigating the capital marketplace. But I'm wondering again, um, where you sit at City, um, the research you've done, the vision you've put forward, how are you starting to think about these barriers to capital moving forward? Well, I think the good news is that the, the one there is, I mean, the, this data was not available up until recently. And so the fact that we're having conversations about it and we're calling it out is incredibly important. The other point I wanna make is both the good news and the bad news. I think this is all about behavior change on the part of the investor. Yes, it's yes. not that there's any deficiency in the part of the investee. It's all about behavior change and conscious and unconscious bias in the investor space. And so um, I think what we need to be thinking about is how do you incent behavior change on the part of the investor and how do you also require that behavior change? And you do that through accountability. So we are big um, proponents of transparency, of reporting. Um, I just had a great discussion with my own team on this topic and said, 
We cannot just report on the deals we do. Where we learn is all on the things that we don't do yeah. and why. The other piece is, I think that part of this is not, it's not just the investor investee relationship, but the business practices of the investor themselves. How is it that they organize their work? What are their practices? What is their commitment to understanding? How do you be an anti-racist investor? There is a lot of work to be done. These can be very scary and uncomfortable words, but like we, we just can't continue down the, the path that we've been we've been going. And so I think there is on a new heading into a new era of accountability. And then the final thing is it also starts with who you have on the team, on the investor side. You know, who's who's in that leadership role? Who's who's doing the work? All of that makes makes a tremendous difference. So we're on a journey. We are, I think, have had the benefit of being in us in our own investor fund, being in startup mode. Um, really over the past 12 months, 12, 15 months, um, while we've also had this incredible commitment to just doing things differently and then going back and making the business case that doing things differently doesn't have any negative impact on the financial bottom line. Well said. Um, and let's make that, that real. I mean, you as social innovators are out in the world trying to navigate and raise capital. Can you each talk about your journeys, um, the headwinds you faced, and if you figured out a way to sort of hack the system? Because I will say, you all um, are, you, know, you as Black women founders are unicorns having gotten past that million dollar threshold. Talk about the challenges as well as how you broke through. Teresa, let's start with you. Yeah, I was so hoping you would start with Fonzie because I was like, oh, this is such... <laughs> And I know we've talked about it before as well, but it um, it has been really challenging. It has been extremely frustrating, um, to be honest. And um, if my why wasn't big enough, I might have quit. You know, but by the year 2030, a hundred million Americans are expected to have an arrest or conviction record, and so that why drives me on a regular basis. But there have been plenty of times um, where it's just been so blatant, where I've even had um, uh, potential funders or investors say, who came up with this idea? And what that really meant was they didn't think I could come up with this idea. Um, I've uh, had investors early on who wanted to sit, you know, uh, dangle the carrot of a bigger check if. I would let them on my board if I would let them have a CFO position. And it was just entirely too early for those types of decisions. And it wasn't the standard protocol uh, for raising money. I know Fonta and I had that conversation before as well. You know, I remember now all of a sudden that you were frustrated one time having that same conversation. So I think for um, many of us, the, the statistics just don't lie. If I were a white man who came up with this uh, solution, and quite frankly, if I didn't even have the proximity of the prison experience, by now I probably would have raised about $40 million. And I say that because I've tracked um, innovations relatively similar to mine that have come um, along the way where they received a million dollars, went through you know, a high-end um, accelerator, I did too, and they received $2 million, $4 million, $8 million, and then a $20 million check. It has been a struggle to get the million, but I've just continued to navigate and navigate and navigate, continuing to believe in myself, believing in um, the mission. I've navigated being black, being female my whole life. So I'm kind of good at this navigation, but it would just be easier if we could just do the, get funded to do the work. We hear you, Teresa. Fonta, I, I know you're gonna um, uh, amplify, but share <laughs> some of your experiences and how you're navigating this world. Yeah, no, it's definitely not easy. Um, you know, I agree with a lot of what Teresa said. I remember some particular situations where, you know, when you're raising venture capital, one, people know that if you're a woman and you're a black woman, it's really hard and the funds are limited. And we got a lot of similar experiences where people were giving us terms that were just really out of the ordinary. Um, for example, things like, you know, despite what the data says and how you should value, um, value your company and your valuation, what that should be. 
um, despite showing that data and that evidence and your traction to investors. I remember situations where we were told, yeah, we see the data, but we really just, something doesn't sit right. We really feel like you should lower your valuation significantly. Um, and didn't really have a justification for why, especially when we compared ourselves to peers. Mm -hmm. Or things like, um, we love what you're doing, but we really have a problem with this social enterprise, social impact thing. Would you consider focusing less on black and brown communities or low to moderate income communities and focus more on white millennials? And we think this could grow. Um, and so, you know, when you're in that situation where you're lean startup and you're bootstrapping, it can be very tempting to kind of take those turns to get to the next level. Um, and we had to walk away from several offers and it was painful. <laughs> you know, it's very painful to go back to the team and say, look, we cannot. Um, bring that person on to our cap table right now. Well, some money is just not good money. And I couldn't in good conscience make those decisions like that. Um, I wouldn't have been able to live with myself, but it just made it so much more difficult. Um, I remember situations too, where we would, um, you know, oftentimes be pitching and, and, you know, I'd be with a lot of my male colleagues and they would get these softball questions and, and, and we would just get such difficult questions, you know, things that you would ask a series A or B or C kind of like uh, venture. And, and it would be like, you know, why, why, is, why is it so difficult for me? And we're at the same level. Um, but one thing I will say, um, <laughs> you know, all of these things I feel made us stronger. It made us scrappier. It made us figure out how to actually sell our product and pre-sell our product because we didn't have a lot of money up front. And I think that's made us stronger. Um, it's giving us a much better valuation in the long run because we held out and we focus more on things like pre-selling and actually making money as a fintech, which is not, <laughs> which can be rare for some in some instances. Um, and so maybe it was a blessing in disguise, you know, that which makes you stronger. Um, but it's definitely not easy. And I think that it was a combination of so many things aligning for us to get to this point. And it's unfortunate that a lot of other people don't have that opportunity. So particularly women and, and black founders. No, the, the, this is a, a difficult journey um, in general, entrepreneurship, um, but for women, women of color, it is particularly difficult. So um, the fact that you are where you are continuing to move forward is a testament to your leadership. Um, Brandy, before I move on to the next question, I'm just curious again, um, given your perch at City, what we often see at, at Echoing Green is how thoughtful and interesting um, innovators like Teresa and Fanta are about capital stacks, right? They're figuring out how to get it done any way they can, right? And sort of um, friends and family with, with, you know, not having the social capital that so many other folks have, trying to figure out debt instruments, trying to crowd in early stage equity investments. Curious, any thoughts, advice on um, how entrepreneurs who may be with us on this call as well, think about that capital stack to grow their enterprises? Well, this is a, we should do a whole other session on the inefficiencies in the financial system and financing entrepreneurship and, and community development, I should say, in, uh, in general as, as well. And uh, excuse me, nonprofit finance, I mean, as, as well. So um, it's, it's uh, lots of inefficiency. You know, one of the things that, that I will just say, I haven't, we haven't figured out how to fully, you know, crack the nut on this, but one of the things that um, I'm really intrigued by is you look at a, even a place like City, where we have every type of, you know, capital offering that a social innovator could probably need, but if you were to say, okay, I want to work with City here, then it's a whole other set of teams yeah. on the other side, and so institutions need to, again, this is this whole idea of, like, how do we break down systemic barriers? It's not necessarily about new capital. It's not necessarily about some new initiative, but take what we do today and do it differently. So we generate dramatically different results. And what if we just made it easier? A very simple idea. We do this for high net worth clients. Why don't we just create a single point of entry and have someone to help you navigate what you need from the full institution? So you know, in some ways it's actually easier to say, oh, we're gonna put capital against this idea. The, the harder piece is to change our behaviors and our patterns and would love to see us have more dialogue about how to join with others in the industry to do that. 
I think that's brilliant. And uh, Echoing Green will raise its hand and welcome um, in our social innovators who would love to be part of that human-centered design experiment, putting them at the center. That's brilliant, Brandy. I think that's terrific. Um, one more question uh, from me before we get into audience questions. I'm sitting here looking at this wonderful group of folks who have joined us to listen in on your conversation. And I'm seeing here one of our um, board members, Maya Ajmera, who's also an Echoing Green alum, terrific serial social entrepreneur, founded Global Fund for Children, but now runs Science for Society. And I joined her last week for her annual Science Talent Search um, announcement where 40 young people from all over the country were um, awarded scholarships for their ideas. And in her remarks, she shared this fascinating vignette that it was during a quarantine when Isaac Newton was in isolation that he came up with the universal law of gravity. I found that head exploding. I thought that was this amazing story I had never heard before, but it shows sort of the opportunities that come along with a global pandemic. We're very focused on the challenges, rightly so, but also this moment of disruption, potential for transformation. I'm really curious, um, and we'll start with the two innovators. You all see bright spots where everyone else sees challenges. What are some of the bright spots that you have seen in this moment? And uh, Teresa, maybe I'll start with you. Okay. I think the uh, biggest bright spot is that we're having conversations like this. Um, like the conversations have emerged. And unless we talk about it, you know, I think for women of color, we would not have come out um, and had these conversations of saying we are bumping up against, you know, racism and, you know, gender bias. And you'd have to be careful um, of even having this type of a conversation 18 months ago. I think that racial, converse, racial uh, wealth gaps, these conversations are front and center. And so it's making it easier for me to give voice um, to my experience. Um, I also think that um, all of the significant pledges that corporations are making, which is really just showing that we're, we're in this together, that it's no longer what feels like often the social innovators problem, um, echoing Green's problem, but it's our collective problem and that we see each other um, in these moments. And so for me, that gives me um, great hope, but I also think it's time for us to make sure that corporations just don't put pledges out there, that we need evidence, we need the receipts of these pledges. Where are you investing? And are you investing in new innovation? Um, there, we need some new su success metrics. You know, when I think of our work, we need new success metrics. It's hard to get funding because we have to go against old metrics. New metrics have to come in and that requires philanthropy. It re requires investors to take bets on the unknown in ways they haven't done it and for about three years. Because in order for us to have new evidence-based research, you're going to have to invest for about three to five years in things that you haven't invested in. And then we'll have a new body of research for the next level of innovators to come forward. Uh, well said, Teresa, sort of this notion of who owns the knowledge and the data, and that's as, and that, that is another structural inequity that keeps out innovators like you from um, showing up in the way the world needs uh, needs you to do the work. Fonta, how about you? Uh, you know, I think that's a great answer. And I think I'm, for me, I'm going to tackle it more from kind of the firm level kind of thought process and what we did. And, um, you know, when you think about quarantining and social distancing and having to raise funds through Zoom... <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to being able to build rapport, um, it makes you um, it makes you learn how to pivot quickly. <laughs> it makes you uh, be a little more innovative in your thought process and how you can leverage partnerships. Um, and when I say partnerships, not only kind of you know how we can partner forward, but also paying it back. Um, I've been spending a lot of time sharing my experiences, lessons learned, tricks of the trade uh, with other women and. Um, and, and, and founders of color. And it's been really nice because, you know, we were all operating, in, in some cases, um, you saw situations where we were operating in this vacuum and we're all competing for this small amount of funding. And now you're seeing partnership. <laughs> I mean, people are coming together and they're sharing, they're collaborating, they're do we're doing joint ventures. And I think this has forced, because we were forced to, to be apart, 
I think it's made us rethink how we can collaborate and the importance of collaboration and empowering each other. Um, because yes, um, there is a lot of, of funding and venture capital that's not easily accessible to us, but we also have a lot of and talent within our own community that we can be leveraging to lift ourselves up. And so I've been really focusing on that. I think that's a, a really bright spot that people um, really um, don't look at enough. Um, and I think that, you know, especially as women, you know, this is how we work. We're collaborative and we should do more of that. And so that's been great for me. That's beautifully said. And I would love to hear um, from you, Brandy, and, and Fonta's remarks, I was reminded there was some interesting scholarship that looked at what happened to the nonprofit industry, but the social impact industry after the economic downturn in 2008. And sort of organizations that sort of got through it and thrived did what Fonta said, they collaborated, right? They over communicated with their donors and their supporters and they got through it better. I'm curious what you see as some of the bright spots in this moment. Yeah, well, for sure, I'll say two things. One is this whole idea of interdependence and recognizing that while we have, we're so polarized, it's, it's been such a time of such incredible polarization, but also a rec recognition that we have such interdependence. I love sort of the rise of the essential worker and a recognition and appreciation and a, you know, I, I haven't felt fully developed in my mind yet, but I think we're gonna look back on this and say that perhaps this was a, disruptive event that helped us to realize that inequality is actually bad for, for all of us. Um, but the other bright spot for me in this is that the expectation, in particular, the behaviors of the private sector, that the expectations are really changing rapidly. It was starting before the pandemic, but I think it, things have really changed in the past year, both the health crisis, racial injustice, and the private sector, you can't just sit on the sidelines anymore. You're gonna lose customers, first and foremost. You're gonna lose employees. You're not gonna be relevant. But I also think that what's exciting for me is to see court institutional investors in corporations really beginning to say, we're not just gonna look at the financial bottom line, but we really wanna understand how you add value to the economy and to society or how you detract value. So for someone who's spent a career, while it looks like what I do is probably mostly external facing, the reality is I'm really an internal change agent. That's all I'm doing is just trying to influence internally to try to direct resources from this institution in different ways. And so I'm excited about this moment and changing norms and, and expectations in that space. Uh, wonderful comments on listening to you, Fonta, so this notion of collaboration, I was reminded I'm reading a new book now by another Equine Green fellow, Sarah Horowitz, um, called Mutualism, Building the Next Economy from the Ground Up. And this notion of, Brandy, you saying interdependence, collaborate, like we are in this together, I think is a very powerful um, narrative that we all need to continue to, to press on. And then in listening to you talk, Brandy, about sort of um, the, the, the business of business, um, you know, thinking about Klaus Schwab's new book about um, stakeholder capitalism, right? And the way that the capital system needs to shift um, for the kind of sustainable, just um, community and world that we all want to live in. I think that's so important. Um, and I think, you know, it's, I can't believe the hour is almost over. I could, I wish we were together, ladies, over a, a cocktail, over a wonderful meal, could spend all evening with you all, but um, uh, we want to at least um, take time for one question. And you all have shown up in such, with such grace, such generosity of spirit, and Fonta, you alluded to this uh, in this moment of how you all are paying it forward, um, working um, to support other women. And we have one question as follows. And she says, as a young black woman trying to make a space for myself and my sisters in the world of business and trying to access capital, how can I, how can I best prepare myself when walking into these rooms where no one looks like me? Powerfully stated. Would love for each of you to respond to um, one of our fellow participants in this panel. I think it's a, a, a really important question. Yeah, um, 100%. Um, it is an important question. And um, this is where just having a community um, is really important. I am, you know, so fortunate that I have the Echoing Green community. 
um, that I can call on and call on a lot of other social entrepreneurs. But prior to that, I created community. I, for me, it was working in um, co-working spaces that gave me the opportunity to create network and community and relationships. Um, and I think that um, I agree with what uh, Randy uh, has said as, as well, that, and Fonta, where women, I think, are um, very open to collaboration. And so just asking, you know, finding someone, taking the courage to send an email, to send it even blind. And if you have to send it to 10 or 20 um, women, women who look like you, and I think you'll be surprised at how many responses you get. I think we're just in a time when if, if someone has the time and the, the time, they will take the time to uplift another woman. Yeah. Beautifully said. Bonta? For me, I would say, um, one, know your numbers. Um, because, you know, when you're in a room and people don't look like you, the numbers speak for themselves. And it's very, very difficult to argue against that. And a lot of um, so, you know, not to stereotype, but there are many cases where I've seen a lot of women, uh, we will shy away from the numbers or we'll downplay our numbers, um, try to be modest, know your numbers, be confident about them, and you go into the room and um, it's a very level, it's a leveling force. <laughs> Um, and then the other thing I would say, and this is just me working as a foreign service officer for 10 years, you can always build rapport with anyone, no matter who they are, what they look like, where they're from, ethnicity, there's a way to find common ground. And so when you walk in those rooms and everyone's kind of frowning and looking skeptically and, and, <laughs> and it's hard to tell kind of where they're coming from, try to kind of figure out a way to build that rapport, make eye contact, smile, and it breaks people down because at the end of the day, we're all human, right? Um, so that's worked for me. Um, yeah. And happy to chat offline about more of, of some things that we did. Thank you for that generosity. Brandy would love to hear some tips uh, as well. Yep. Just really quickly, I would say, remember that everybody has a story. You know, I, I, I love the fact, Cheryl, that you were like, oh, I, Brandy, I never knew your story. And all of a sudden it makes you, you know, so everybody's got that, got that story inside of them. And frankly, if they don't, and you can't build that rapport, I know this is so, it's probably easy for me to say, cause I'm sitting on that other side of the table, but you know what, it, this is all about relationships. And if you don't get that right feeling from the investor, from the partner, from the funder, from the beginning, it, you know what? It's, it's a, someone very wise once said to me, it's all there at entry. And if it doesn't feel right, then it's gonna only get worse. So keep in mind your power that you have, that you can walk in the room and you can walk out of the room. I think that's beautifully, beautifully said. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, joke, I'm like, this pandemic has to be over so I can get this gray out of my hair. And there's not much I like about being, uh, being old, but I will say there's something about hopefully the wisdom um, and uh, acceptance, because you've seen a lot and done a lot. And for this, um, I presume, young woman who is trying to forge her way as an entrepreneur, um, sort of learning to compartmentalize some of that self-talk um, where structures try to tell us who we are as women, uh, as people of color. And it is, um, it's the system's residue that weighs us down and makes us doubt ourselves. Um, and we've just got to block out those voices. And it's interesting, it's gotten so much easier for me as I've gotten older. Um, and, but that, that that's something that um, younger folks have to get to more quickly. But I think each of you had such a pearl of wisdom um, to share um, with the young woman who asked that question. And until um, we get to the point where access to capital is not another headwind that you know folks like Teresa and Bond and so many others face. Um, not only right knowing your cash flow, like what you need, but recognizing you're going to have to be resourceful and find other means to fund and bootstrap your business because you go out into the world not as we want it to be, but as it is. Um, and sort of living to fight another day is something that women entrepreneurs, women of color entrepreneurs, sort of that intersectional entrepreneur confronts daily. Um, but it is uh, not easy, but it is necessary. Um, but we're going to get there because of leaders like the three women that I've had the privilege to interview for this past hour. It was absolutely tremendous. Um, I would love to ensure that you all have a final moment to say a few parting words to our guests, but I just want to thank each of you. Um, it was an honor 
um, to be in conversation with you. I learned a tremendous amount and that's really meaningful to me. Thank you for all that you do. Um, Fanta and Teresa, um, we remain humbled by you as Echoing Green Innovators. You're changing the world and you do it with such grace and brilliance. Brandy, we would not be here today without your commitment and your transformational leadership and investment in our work. And we're excited to partner with you on the Racial Equity Philanthropic Fund. And part of that work is going out into the world and identifying more BIPOC leaders over the next few years to put their shoulder to the wheel on some of our toughest challenges. So if there are folks on the line who are interested in applying, go to echoinggreen.org backslash apply. Our next application cycle opens on April the 6th. So just wanted to do that quick shout out. So um, quick round, Robin, w want to end on a high note with the wisdom and brilliance of these three phenomenal women leaders. And I'm gonna start um, counterclockwise. So Teresa, I'm gonna start with you. Parting yeah. words. Yeah. Um, first, thank you again. Um, this has been a fantastic hour and sure like it. Do this all evening with you as well. So maybe when the pandemic is over, I'm excited and ready to do that. Um, but for me, it's just um, stay encouraged. I think, um, Cheryl, you said it on one of the calls I was on. It's like there's a crack in the universe and we have to take advantage of this moment and we have to be steadfast and we've got to find our tribe. I was fortunate that Echo and Green was one of my tribes. And it inspires me on a regular basis, but there are communities out there. Find a community because you can't do this work by yourself. Beautiful. Fata? Onward and upward. Yes. <laughs> Perfectly said. A woman of few words because she's out there building a business and it's perfect. Thank you, Fata. And Brandy, of course, last but not least, thank you for um, hosting this event. This was powerful. Parting words for us today. Um, exhaustion is real. We're all feeling it. I'm going to tell you for me, it's five o'clock. I haven't felt more energized all day than I do right now for spending time with new people. And that's what I would say is push yourself, even in this moment where we crave sort of comfort is just to push yourself to build those, those new relationships. It's more important than ever. So thank you. Beautifully said, ladies, right? The world would be a much better place if we were more relational and less transactional. Um, and the social capital that Brandy talked about um, is the thing that will elevate us um, all. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to all of your guests. Um, this was an incredibly wonderful way to spend Women's History Month. And be safe, be well, and thank you, Teresa, Fonte, and Brandy for inspiring all of us. Take good care, everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Bye, guys.